And I know that it would be nice to preach a nice three-point sermon on Mother's Day and or acrostic, what M-O-T-H-E-R means, but that's not me. And so I want to I want to share with you this morning about three things that I believe will usher in a revival such as we have never seen in this generation. We need it desperately, and uh, and I believe that the revel, uh, the the re revival that we need is going to be so powerful that it's not going to it's not going to come from a main denomination. It's not going to come from the it's not going to come from uh, some of the well known speakers. It's going to come from those who are hidden. I like to say it's going to come from the Davids that are out in the field, and the church will go over the sons of Jesse and look at who's qualified. And it's not your qualification that makes you um, appointed. It is God's calling. Whom God calls, he equips. And he equips some to go to Bible school, such as Priscilla and others. And others, God can give you the gift of extraneous preaching and teaching. Uh, that just uh, amazes me to know that God can do those things. And so uh, I want to start off this morning by um, uh, talking about the three things uh, in the progression toward revival. Um, if we want to see revival, if we want to see God begin to move in our hearts and in our lives and in our homes and in our churches and our relatives, we want to make sure that we're taking the proper steps. I believe that when we're not taking the proper steps toward revival, what ends up happening is we have emotionalism and we have a bunch of religion that just takes place. This is not a message on revival. This is just an introduction to, to my message on repentance, forgiveness, and restoration. Because I believe that as we do those things, God will begin to pour out his spirit upon us and will be blessed. But revival is not something that God does for us, but something that we get energized to do something for God. I believe that. So many times we're waiting for revival so we can get a touch, we can get a healing, we can get a deliverance, we can get all these things, but I believe the next revival God pours of his spirit is going to be a question. Who will go? Whom shall I send? And I believe that that's going to be God's heart. Whom shall I send and who will go for us? And the answer is you. Amen. And before I go any further, I forgot all about this, but it's good to have Louis in the service again. He had surgery on his on his his shoulder, and we've been praying for him, and we we've been asking the Lord to touch him in a speedy recovery. So we're glad to have you with us, brother. God bless you. And so I believe the revival that God is doing, and if you look around, you see there's there's an increase of people, and I believe that there's going to continue to be an increase of people. I'm, I'm being blessed and seeing people saved and filled with the Holy Ghost, people healed and delivered. That's part of the gospel message. But the first thing I want to talk about this morning is uh, repentance, forgiveness, and restoration. Because a lot of people get them confused. They think that repentance is forgiveness. And um, it's not really that way. It does, have a, it does have a play in it. If I can put it on these three things, repentance, forgiveness, and restoration, is like a chain. You all know what a chain looks like, right? You see a nice big fat chain? Okay, well, repentance is one of the links. Forgiveness is one of the links. And restoration is one of the links. It makes a part of the chain, but it's different. Each, each one has a separate link. Each one is different. And so I want to talk this morning about repentance because I believe that so many of us go to God, and this may be something that's going on in your life at this particular time. You may go to God and you may repent and then five or ten minutes or an hour or two hours or a day or two days or a week later, you keep doing the same thing over and over again. How many have ever been in that situation? Well, the reason why is we go to God and we ask God for forgiveness. Okay? But God wants us, first, and all, first of all, to go through the pattern that he's chosen. And the pattern that he's chosen is repentance, forgiveness, restoration. You can't have restoration without Repentance. And what happens sometimes is when we're going through the process of, of growing in Christ, we may do something, we fall, and then we ask God to forgive us, and then we go and we fall on that thing again, and then we ask for forgiveness. We keep falling on that thing, and we ask for forgiveness. And someone asked me the question. She said, Pastor, how do you change? How do, how do we change? You know, it's, it's, it's a good question. How do we change? Well, if you keep going to God and asking for forgiveness, but you don't repent, then you're going to keep doing the same thing over and over again. 
And so as you see, as I begin to show you, through repentance is the, rest, is, is the restoration of forgiveness, and through, the, through forgiveness is the restoration of your life, and how God will begin to open up the windows of heaven and pour out blessing spiritually, financially, emotionally, uh, in your life, in your home. And that's the process. So we're going to talk about repentance for a moment. A lot of people think that repentance is just, um, God forgive me, I'm sorry. But I, I want you to understand that the definition of repentance. First and foremost, the, the, the word repent means to change, a change of mind about sin and about God, which results in the turning from sin to God. In other words, when you repent, when you truly repent before the Lord, what you're doing is, is you're coming into an agreement with what God says in his word. And you're saying, okay, God, your word says this. Therefore, Lord, I repent because I don't think that way. I think this way. So when you repent, you're saying to God, okay, I'm going to go with what you think and what you say versus what I think and what I say. So if I'm walking this way in this direction, and I'm walking in my ways and what I think and what I, what I believe, and all of a sudden God begins to show me in his word that the thing that I'm believing and thinking is wrong, then I have to repent before God. I have to change my mind. That's where it starts in your mind. You have to come to the conclusion that you're going to change your mind about that situation. And when you change your mind, you're turning in the opposite direction. And now you're walking toward what God has in store for you. Now in the process of that, if you've sinned in that process, that's when you go to God and you ask for forgiveness. But see, a lot of people are just going through forgiveness without the change of repentance. And when you change your mind, you will begin to see, the, you'll be see, begin to see that God will begin to set you free. How many know when Jesus said, you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free? All right. What was the first message Jesus preached? He didn't preach on forgiveness. He preached on repentance. His first message was, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. In other words, in order for you to get forgiveness, in order for you to give forgiveness, you've got to go through the process of repentance. You've got to go through the changing of your mind saying, you know what? I thought I knew this was the way that, I should, you know, that God wants things or I should live. But then God's word says, this is wrong. And so therefore, I'm going to repent. Now, I'll give you an example. You, you see uh, somebody in ministry um, that is taking money from the, from the offering. Okay? Let's say, one of, I'm, I can't use anybody here because everybody's honest, I believe. Okay. But let's just say somebody here was taking the offering and, and they, they brought it back to Bob. But on the way back to Bob, they grabbed their hand and put it in, grabbed some money and put it in their pocket. Okay? Now, I believe that God, I believe that Jesus who knew everything, right? Didn't he? The only thing he didn't know in his humanness was the time of his return. That's the only time. But in his divinity, he knows everything. Okay. And so he knew when he went and he chose 12 apostles that one of them was a devil. Judas. He knew Judas was, was a thief. What did, what did Jesus do? He gave him the checkbook to the ministry. Now, in a, in, a, in a business world, in a business sense, right, you and I would look at that and say, I'm not giving a thief my checkbook. I'm not giving a thief my credit card. That's crazy. Why did God do that? Why did God reach out to, to Judas and give him the checkbook to the ministry? He held the money bag. Because God was giving Judas a chance to repent. Isn't that wonderful? Amen. Even at the loss of financial gain. Because the soul is far more valuable than money. And so God wants us to repent, to change our minds about things that we believe or things that we do. So that we can move into genuine forgiveness. Now that not only is good for you, but that's also good for others that have sinned against you. Amen? That the same forgiveness you receive is the same forgiveness you give to others. You have to change your mind. Amen. <clears throat> 
Let's look for a moment in the, in the, in the Bible. Um, Mark 9.13. While you're, while you're doing that, I just want to read this about repentance. Repentance includes a sinner taking the blame for his sinful condition. I just want to move this down a little bit. Repentance includes a sinner taking the blame for his sinful condition before God and siding with him against himself. A penitent blames no one else for his condition, but rather condemns himself under God's eternal wrath because he deserves it. But I say unto you that Elias indeed has come, they have done unto him whatsoever. Is that the scripture? Did I give you the right one? I'm sorry, Matthew 9, 13. I don't have, I don't, this, this print sometimes gets me. Matthew, I'm sorry, Matthew 9, 13. <clears throat> I left a T out, that's why it looked like an R. But go ye and learn what that meaneth, for I will have mercy and not sacrifice. For I am not come to call the righteous, but sinners to what? Why not sinners to forgiveness? You hear a lot about forgiveness. You hear messages on forgiveness, very little on repentance. And so what happens, people think that they can just go on. They have a, 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 they have a misnomer about forgiveness. They think, well, all I've got to do is go to God every time I sin and ask for forgiveness. So they're continually living in the same thing. Just think for a moment, if you had a loved one, a, fa a, a husband or a, or a wife, that went out and cheated on you and came back and said, I'm sorry, please forgive me. And then next week went out and did it again, and the following week went out and did it again, and went out, did it again, but just kept asking you for forgiveness. You'd have to question why they were asking you for forgiveness when they didn't mean it. It's not that they don't mean it, it's that they haven't repented. And so... I believe in the church today we have a lot of people asking for forgiveness but very few repenting. Because if you repent of your sin, there's going to be a change. Because you're changing your mind, you're changing your actions, you're changing the, your thoughts, you're changing what you think to what God thinks. When you are truly repented as a, as a Christian, you're no longer going to go to the places that you used to go. Amen. Amen. Praise God, I don't need to be a Christian and go to a disco. Amen. Now you know my age because I said disco, right? Uh, whatever nightclub, I don't need to do that anymore. Okay, because I had a change of mind, my change of, you know, they, they got spirits there too, you know. Amen. They even see it on the sign, come, we have spirits, yeah. I wonder what kind of spirits they got. They ain't got God's spirit. But again, what I'm saying to you is, is that the reason why a lot of the church is in its condition, and Jesus even said that, he says, when I come back, will I find faith on the earth? Am I going to find real faith? Well, I guess he didn't know about all the faith preachers on TV, did he? Yeah, he did. <laughs> but that's one of the things why you don't see the miracles, the signs and the wonders, because people are just living in forgiveness and not living with repentance. That's re that'll be leading to restoration. And so there's a process, there's a process that it will take you through. When you come to the conclusion that you need to repent, you, you say to yourself, okay, God, this is what you say. I've been doing it this way. I take responsibility for it. I am sorry. I'm not going to blame mommy, daddy, auntie, uncle, sister, brother. I'm going to blame myself and say, God, forgive me. I'm sorry. Here's where forgiveness comes in. And once you come into the area of forgiveness, then you come into the place of restoration. It's awesome, I'm telling you. You know, because I sat back one day and I said, Lord, how come there are some Christians that really struggle with alcohol? How come there's Christians that study, uh, that's, that, uh, that have a hard time with drugs, being free? How come there are some that have a hard time with cigarettes? Because when I became a Christian, when I repented, God took all those things away. And I don't have to keep stumbling and falling in those things because that person no longer lives. We sang the song, Redeem, today. That old man inside of me, I don't have to give in to that old man inside of me because his days are long dead and gone. 
For when, when Jesus was crucified on the cross, the Bible says that my old man was crucified with him. So that, we might, so that we might walk in newness of life. It's not about renewing your own. It's not about renewing you and giving you the strength to live out the life. Because you can't. So God gave you a new nature. He gave you a new way of thinking. And that's through repentance. Amen. And if we truly repent, then God will begin to bring the restoration in our life. Luke chapter 3 verse 8 says this. Luke chapter 3, verse 8. I've got a few, I don't even know if I'll get through all this today, but. Bring forth, therefore, fruits worthy of repentance. What's a fruit worthy of repentance? A fruit that is worthy of repentance is a change. There's a lot of people that do repent, but they don't mean it. Jesus said that about the, the Pharisees and the Sadducees. He said, well, has Isaiah prophesied of you because you speak of me with your lips, but your heart is far from me. Now, he's not talking about the physical pumping heart in your body. He's talking about the spiritual man that's inside of you. See, because you can go to God and say, I repent, but if you don't mean it, it's not going to take place and root in your life. Amen. Repentance is a change of mind, a change of attitude, when you look in one direction, and you, you walk, your life is in this direction, and you re, God shows you that's wrong, so you tell Him, I take responsibility, I ask for forgiveness, and now I'm walking in a different direction. As you begin to walk in that forgiveness, as you begin to walk in that re, in, into that repentance, you are walking in the direction of restoration. Amen. This is good stuff. What does God think of repentance? What do you think that all of create all that God created in heaven thinks of repentance? Look at Luke 15 verse 7. It'll be up on the screen for you so if you don't want to thumb through. Luke 15:7 says, "I say unto you likewise joy shall be in heaven over one sinner that asks for forgiveness. No. No, I know, I, I, I trapped you on that one. Joy shall be in heaven over one sinner that what? Repents. That means has a change of mind and attitude toward what he believes is right. And God says, no, it's wrong. And you say, okay, God, I'm agreeing with you. I'm changing my mind. And now I'm asking you to forgive me for this thing. And I'm walking in a different, different way. And if you do that, all of heaven and all the angels of heaven rejoice. Because why? Because now you're heading down the road of restoration. You're heading down the road of being restored. Hallelujah. Things are going to start to turn out differently in your life. Hallelujah. I hope you're getting it. What are some of the things that we can see in our life that bring repentance to us? 2 Corinthians verse 7, 9 says this. Now I rejoice, not that you were made sorry, but that you sorrowed to repentance. 2 Corinthians 7, 9. Now I rejoice, not that you were made sorry, but that you sorrowed to repentance. In other, words, in other words, God doesn't take pleasure in you going through hard times. Amen. Some people say, well, you know, I, I, had to, I had to become a drug addict and I had to go down to the basement and I had to eat in garbage cans before the Lord. I surrendered to the Lord. Hello? You don't have to go that low. Amen. You don't have to wait for it to get that bad. God doesn't rejoice that you were made sorry, but he rejoices that you sorrow to repentance. That's the, end of the, that's the whole end of the matter. 
That God is not, not happy that you had to go through everything you went through in life. But God is happy that, that those things have brought you to the place of repentance. Because as you repent and as you change your mind and heart, God is going to begin to bring that forgiveness and that restoration in your life where you can begin to thank Him and praise Him and say, God, like Priscilla said, God, you're faithful. I, I, he just blows my mind because He's so great and He's so wonderful to us. He said that, For ye were made sorry after a godly manner, that you might receive damage by us in nothing. Can I tell you, you'll find no manipulation here. I will not manipulate you to come forward to get, receive Christ. No. Because you can come up this aisle and you can say the sinner's prayer and you can weep till your eyes turn red. But unless you repent... There is no solidity in, in your walk with God. Amen. You've got to repent. I'm telling you, this is the beginning of revival. Amen. When people begin to change their mind and say, you know what, I'm sick and tired of just going to church every Sunday. I'm sick and tired of going on Wednesday. I'm sick and tired of going on Monday. I don't want to just go to church. I want to be the church. Come on, somebody, say amen. 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 Hallelujah. And then he says in verse 10, For godly sorrow works what? Repentance. To salvation, not to be repented of, but the sorrow of the world works death. When you go through the things in the world without God, it's death. When you go through financial difficulties and you go through all kinds of uh, emotional problems and all kinds of psychological problems and you go through all kinds of drug addiction and alcoholism and it goes from generation to generation to generation and you get to that point where you think, wow, man, this, is this what I'm going to turn out like? Is this what my family's going to, if I have kids, are they going to turn out this way? What is the story? God says, the story is this, repent and you can break that chain, you can break that thing in your life. And you don't have to continually be going on that road that you're going on. Amen. God can change it when you change your mind and you repent. Amen. Praise God, hallelujah. I'll tell you, nothing makes a mother more happy on Mother's Day than her kid to repent. Amen. <laughs> Second Timothy verse twenty five, Second uh, Timothy two twenty five. Apostle Paul's talking to Pastor Timothy, and he says, "In meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves." You know, there's people that fight against themselves. <laughs> really, they're in a boxing match with themselves. They're always knocking themselves down, always talking about themselves, you know, I'm no good, I'm never going to amount to anything. And guess what? As we preached last week, as a man thinketh, so is he. You've got to start changing your thinking. I like what Brother Norman used to say, change your thinking, stinking. Uh, your stinking thinking. In meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves, look at this part. If God preadventure will give them repentance... It's a gift. If you struggle and say, God, you know, I, re I really want you, but I need, you to, I need your grace to repent. God will give it to you. He'll give you the ability to repent. Amen. Now, there's other hindering things to, re to repentance. One is pride. Another one's arrogance. I don't need to repent. Yes, you do. Everybody needs to repent. Amen. Needs to change their mind and begin to go in God's way. He said that God will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth. That's what, that's what repentance does. It brings a knowledge of truth to you. And the Bible says, whom the, sun set, as whom the sun sets free is free indeed. You shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Are you free this morning? Are you free when, you, when God shows you something and says, this is what you need to do. You need to repent. 
Then you don't have to keep doing the same thing over and over and over and over and over and over, falling on your face. I met somebody that used to come to this church years ago. Hadn't seen him in years. Last time I saw him, he fell on his face because he was, he was an alcoholic. Okay? Had scars all over his face. I saw him the other day on the avenue. And I stopped. I said, hey. I don't want to say his name on CD. I said, hey, how you doing? I looked at his face. He fell down again. His face all scraped up. I'm like, man, you haven't changed. You're the same as I saw you four, five, six years ago. And you're still in that condition. Doesn't it bother you? That's crazy. Well, that's the definition Albert Einstein gave. Doing the same thing over and over again, expecting a different result, is insanity. There's a lot of insane people walking around. Thinking that they can change. You can't change. I know when I was out in the world and I was partying and going to all the nightclubs and everything and I'd go out on New Year's Eve and you know, I'd drink my head off and get sick as a dog and me and a toilet bowl had a relationship that night. And after I, when I was going through the process of things, I, I look up to God and say, Oh, never again. I'm never going to do this again. I, um, this is it. I've had it. And only two days later, my friend would come over with a six-pack or a 12-pack and say, Hey, come on, let's have a few. And go right back into it. Why? Because we can't in and of ourselves have the strength to do the things that only God can give us the ability to do. And when we do, we ask God, God... You know, it breaks my heart because when I, when I look at different people and I see different people, what they go through in their life, I mean, this one's an alcoholic, their grand, great, great grandfather was an alcoholic, their grandfather, their father was an alcoholic, they're an alcoholic, their children are alcoholics. And they, they think they get into a place of hopeless, hopelessness where they, they don't think they can get out of that. But there's one way to break that chain. Hallelujah. And how God breaks that chain is through repentance. That when we truly repent, God begins to put things in our heart that way we can ask for forgiveness and we get forgiven and we don't have to be a slave to those things anymore. I don't have to drink anymore. I don't have to smoke cigarettes anymore. I don't have to take drugs anymore. I haven't done it in 30 years. And if God will do it for me, He'll do it for you. Hallelujah. Praise God. Hallelujah. And those areas that we struggle with is because we haven't repented. We just ask for forgiveness. Let's move to the next topic because I'm running out of time. Forgiveness. Before I do that, before I do that, let's look at Acts 3.18. I want to I share that scripture with you. Acts 3.18. I don't know if I did that yet. Acts 3.18. But those things which God before had showed by the mouth of all his prophets that Christ should suffer, he hath so fulfilled. Christ has done all of these things so that you and I can have repentance. So that you and I can be forgiven. So that you and I can be restored. The topic of forgiveness, or the next link in the chain, is forgiveness. Psalm 130, starting with verse 3. Psalm 130, starting with verse 3. I believe the revival's coming. It's already here. And it's starting with you and I in repentance. What is revival but that bringing that which is dead back to life? Psalm 130, verse 3. If thou, Lord, shouldest mock iniquities... O oh Lord, who shall stand? In other words, if God was to take account of sin in our lives, who would be able to stand? Nobody. And I hear people all the time say this, I've gone too far. I've done too much. I've hurt too, too deeply. And I want you to know the words of Jesus were so beautiful to a woman who was caught in adultery. He said, woman, thy sins are forgiven. Go and sin no more. There's nothing that you have done 
Listen to me. There's nothing that you have done. There's nothing that you have said. There's nothing that you have felt where God is not able to forgive you. Because God says, repent. For the kingdom of God is at hand. If you knew, if God could give you a vision of the end times and you could see how close we are to the coming of the Lord, you would repent. <laughs> You'd get right with Him. Amen. All you've got to do is look around you and see the world and how it's going. We're going to a cashless society. We're going to eventually go to a mark in your forehead or your hand like Revelation says. It's coming. And if we know that and we see that, we've got to ask God for repentance. Praise the Lord. Praise God. Forgiveness. Verse 4. But, but there is forgiveness with thee. You can be forgiven. Why? So that God may be feared. So that God would be feared. You have a God who is willing to forgive you. Acts 13, verse 38. Be it known unto you, therefore, men and brethren, that through this man, Jesus, is preached unto you the forgiveness of sins. But the formula for forgiveness isn't just going to God and confessing your sin. It's repentance. Somehow the church has lapsed in this area. They, they, we think that, well, since we have Christ now, we can just go out and sin. Paul says in Romans, he says, shall we continue to sin that grace may abound? God forbid. No. Why? Because there's been a change. When you repent, there's a change of thinking. There's a change of heart. And now you're going in a new direction. Be it known unto you, therefore, men and brethren, that through this man Jesus is preached unto you the forgiveness of sins. Isn't it great to have your sins forgiven? Amen. There's such peace and joy in knowing that you can be restored. Amen. That you don't have to live under guilt every time something happens in your life. And usually what happens is, is that people are asking for forgiveness but not repenting. Luke 7.47 says this, Wherefore I say unto thee, her sins which are many are forgiven, for she loved much. But to whom little is forgiven, the same loveth little. What happens is, you go to a, you go to a CEO, or you go to a banker, you go to a lawyer, or you go to a, a religious person and you ask them, if you die, how are you going to go to heaven? And they'll tell you this. Well, what's going to happen is I'll stand before God and he'll, he'll judge me whether I, all the right things I did and all the wrong things I did. That's the mentality of some people. And my question to them is this. Suppose you have 99 bad things and 98 good things, you missed it by one. What a bummer that would be. <laughs> Missing heaven by one thing. No. It's because of grace you've been saved. It's through the process of repentance, forgiveness, and restoration. That, and God knows that it's a growing process. But as you grow and as you repent, you begin to change. And as you begin to change, you begin to see things differently in your life. One time I had a dream and I saw a man walking. And he had a big ball and chain on his leg. And he kept dragging it. And then he came to Jesus. 
Got born again, but he kept dragging that ball and chain. And I asked him, I said, why are you, you know, why, why, are you, why is that ball and chain still on you? He said, that's part of my life. That's who I am. No, that's not part of who you are. God has a new plan and a new purpose for your life. And oh, you shake off those shackles, shake off those old things. You don't have to have those old things anymore. And God will begin to restore your life if you repent. Hallelujah. You're welcome. Acts 26, verse 18. One of the things that Jesus wants to do is to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light. See, before you're a Christian, you're walking in darkness. You ever walk in darkness, you bump into things. You trip, you fall, you get hurt. Because you can't see. But when you give your heart to Jesus and you repent of your sins, what happens is, is that God begins to bring you from darkness into his marvelous light. And now you see things a whole different way than you used to. Amen. Why? Where does the process of sight start? In your mind. You have neutrons and all kinds of things going on in your brain that produce the ability to see. That's why some people get back, whacked in the back of the head where the, where the eyesight is and they lose their sight. What happens is when God brings you into light, it's because you changed your mind. You repented. And when you repented, God begins to give you more light. Praise God. Look what it says. To turn you from darkness to light. And here's, a, here's one that a lot of people don't like. And from the power of Satan... Unto God. Here's the keys of Satan that will bind up your life. One, pride. The key of pride. I don't have to do that. I'm not doing that. The second key to that is I will not forgive. See, Jesus said this. Forgive and you shall be forgiven. I know people that have not forgiven and they're going through torment. And the Bible says, Jesus said this in the word, he said this, that if you do not forgive men from your heart, he will send the tormentors up towards you. People that won't forgive are tormented. Why? Why are they so tormented? Because I say it this way. What right do you have to... Be an unforgiving towards somebody when God has forgiven you of all that you've gone through. So when you repent, you change your mind. When you repent, you say, God, I'm not going to think the way you're telling me to forgive. I'm forgiven. That's it. You repent, you change your mind. God begins the restoration process. One of the greatest hindrances to people's families to come to Christ. Know what that is? They don't forgive. And then we get the pride and we say, why should I be the one to forgive? They're the ones that did this. They're the ones that did that. They should come to me. They should ask for forgiveness. Do you know that forgiveness is a choice? But if you want to see restoration in your life, you've got to forgive. Believe me, if Linda and I have not forgiven people of the things that they said against us, did to us in the ministry, that's why people that want to be pastors, they have no idea. Any day you want to be, you want to be a pastor, come on up here, I'll let you be a pastor for a week. You'll say to me, God, I don't ever want to be a pastor again. <laughs> it looks glorious, it looks wonderful, it looks like, you, you, you know. <laughs> but we go through some of the most hurtful times. People sometimes say the most hurtful things. But if we didn't forgive, we, we wouldn't be, you all wouldn't be here today. That's right. But we have chosen to forgive because 
We've repented. And we've seen God restore in our life through that process. He says, but he's turned you to, from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God. That they might receive what? Forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. You have an inheritance. Now, see, I can tell you all day long, you've got an inheritance down at, at uh, Bank of America. You have an inheritance there. I could tell you that all day long, but until you go down to Bank of America and do it for yourself, guess what? You're not going to partake of it. Amen. You have an inheritance that God has a plan for you. Jeremiah 29, 11. I know the thoughts I have towards you, thoughts of peace, not of evil, to give you an expected end. That's God's will for your life. God wants to give you an expected end. God wants to give you a destiny. God wants to give you a plan for your life. But if you keep going on the same way you're going, guess what? You ain't going to achieve it. You haven't achieved it all these years. What makes you think you're going to do it? Because there's a power of Satan that's stopping you. Are you hearing me? There's a power of Satan stopping you. Doesn't want people to repent. Oh, you don't have to repent. All you've got to do is just be better. Be good. There's none good. No, there's nobody good enough. I couldn't be good enough. Look at Acts 22 for a moment. You might remember this story about the guy that wanted to buy uh, the gifts of the Holy Spirit. You know, he wanted, he, wanted to, he wanted to lay hands on people so they could receive the Holy Ghost too. In Luke, who's, who, uh, I'm sorry, um, in Acts 8.22, it says this. How are we doing, Tom? Good. Repent, therefore. Uh, is that it? Let me check one more time. 8.22. Repent, therefore, of this thy wickedness, and pray God, if perhaps the thought of thy heart may be forgiven thee. See the two difference? Repentance and forgiveness. Repent, therefore. In other words, you need to get right with God. This guy was trying to buy the gifts. Repent, therefore, of this thy wickedness. And pray God, perhaps the thought of thy heart may be forgiven thee. But it had to be genuine repentance. Sometimes we repent, but you know, sometimes we think we repent. Well, God, you know... I I acknowledge that I'm wrong. But all the time we really want our own way. God knows that. There has to be a genuine repentance. And then you'll have forgiveness with genuine repentance, but if you have no genuine repentance, you won't have forgiveness. You'll still be under that cloud of condemnation and guilt. Hallelujah. Well, maybe God can forgive some of my sins, trespasses, but he can't forgive them all. I've just done too much. You don't know the pain. I've, you don't know what I've done. Look at Colossians 2.13. And I've only got a few minutes left. I've got to move. Colossians 2.13. And you being dead in your sins. Did you know you were a walking dead man? right. Unless you're saved and you're sanctified and you've and you got, you got the Holy Ghost living in you, you're a dead man. And you being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your heart and your flesh hath he quickened, made alive, brought back to life together with him, having forgiven you some. All transgressions. All i got to jump down. My, uh, Matthew 6.14 says, If you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. Matthew 6.15, But if you forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. So if you're still in your trespasses, you're still in, you're still in, you're still in death. You're not in life. You're not being restored. There's been a, 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 something that has crept in to just rob and steal and kill from you. 
I'm going to skip a bunch of scriptures because I don't have time, but my third point is restoration. Jeremiah 30, verse 17. I love this. You getting something out of this? I hope so. Look at what God says. Look what God says to you. For I will, say I will. God's will is to do it. It's up for you to receive it. You know, you can have, how many of you have cable TV or have some kind of cable system, right? You can have the wire coming in from the cable. You can have the service. You can have all the channels. But something has to take place first. You've got to plug that cable into what is called a receiver. And so that it can receive the signal coming into your house. And then it's got a transfer or it's got another output where it will send the signal out to the TV. So a receiver is one that gets in but also gives out. Hello. He said, I will restore health unto thee. That's not just the physical health. That's spiritually. God's in the restoring business. Look at this. Say, and. He's going to restore, right? We already said that. It's God's will to restore. And it's God's will, will to heal also all your wounds. Anybody been wounded? Anybody been hurt? In life, if we really admit it, yeah, we've been hurt. We won't show it to anybody. We won't tell anybody, but God knows our hearts. And he says, I will restore health to you. I will heal thy wounds. Saith the Lord, because they called thee an outcast, saying, this is Zion whom no man seeketh after. A person who felt like they were worth nothing. God says, I will restore health to you. I will heal thee of your wounds. And though they, people may say there's no hope for you, that you're too far gone, he said, they said that, but no man seeketh after that. God will heal you. God is the restorer. That's God's will. Look at Joel chapter 2 verse 25. Feel the anointing of the Holy Ghost. Amen. So I don't want to preach a message just to make your emotional feel good. Take you up on an emotional roller coaster. Ah, praise God! Ah, hallelujah! <laughs> and the Lord said, ah! Ever hear preachers like that? And the Lord, ah! I want to preach that. I want to, pre I want to teach you something. I want you to get something solid so that when you leave this place, you'll be a different person. Amen. Joel chapter 2, verse 25. Look at this. Look at this. Say, I will. I will. That's God speaking. Restore to you the years. Look at this. Years. Years, years that you've been going through the same thing. God says, I'm going to restore to you the years that the locusts had eaten and the canker worm and caterpillar and the palm word. My great army which I sent among you has destroyed. Amen. Why did God send that? Why did God send the locust? Why did God send the canker worm, the, ca the, ca the caterpillar and the palm worm? Why did God send it? It was his judgment because the people wouldn't repent. So if you don't repent, your years will not be restored. You'll still get eaten by locusts and canker worms and caterpillars and palm worms. will still destroy the, the ways of your life. But when you repent, God says, I will restore to you the years that the locusts have eaten, the canker worm, the caterpillar, the palm worm, my great army which I sent among you. And once we do that, once we go through that process, repentance 
Forgiveness. Restoration. Look what God says. Galatians 6.1. Amen. Hey Amen. Good. You know, I got a lot of stuff. Good. Why did you get it? Because God wants you to give it. You receive it, now transmit it. Galatians 6.1. Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, you which are what? Spiritual. What is that? What does that mean, spiritual? What's, you, that, you that are spiritual. You that are the, the pastor and have all the gifts and all the talents? No. You that are spiritual. You are the one who is practicing repentance, forgiveness, and restoration. So that includes every one of us. It's not for the evangelist or the pastor or those that are up in the front preaching and teaching. It's for all of you. If you see a brother who has got a fault or a sin that you see him in, you which are spiritual, do what? Restore. restore him. Why? Because you are restored. You cannot restore somebody if you're not restored yourself. Amen. Restore such a one in the spirit of meekness. Considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. And I'm going to close with these next two verses. 2 Corinthians 5.18 and 19. And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself. Are you hearing me? God is in the reconciling business. Amen. God who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. 2 Corinthians 5.18 and 19, verse 19. To wit, or to understand that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself. Not imputing their trespasses unto them and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. What you have heard this morning is the word of reconciliation. Repentance. Forgiveness. Restoration. Hallelujah. That's the word of reconciliation. Is repentance, forgiveness, restoration. You cannot skip one or the other to get to be restoration. It doesn't work that way. You have to go through the process in order to get to the end result. Amen? Amen. Brother Bob, would you play something, please? One of the most unrecognized. Because I want to say this, there's a lot of mothers that are hurting. There are a lot of mothers that don't treat their children right. But always remember this one thing. And this breaks my heart. Hurting people hurt people. It's hard. To understand that. But when you get to the place where you understand that hurting people hurt people. Sometimes they don't mean to. It's just out of their nature. That's what they do. But until they come to a place of restoration. Until they come to a place rather of, of repentance. Forgiveness. And restoration. They can't see because they're in darkness. The Bible says about darkness. We talked about it. How that darkness Satan keeps him in that darkness but the moment the light comes on is what repentance 